Hello everybody, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ASA webinar, COVID Lessons Learned, Home Care Solidifies Its Place in Healthcare. This is part of the Empowering Professionals and Aging series presented by Home Instead, franchisor of the Home Instead Network. My name is Julia Burroughs. I am the Program Coordinator for the American Society on Aging, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. We will be getting started shortly. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen labeled Resources. Under the tab labeled CE Application here, you will find information on how to obtain CE credit for today's event. You have 60 days to complete the Continuing Education application, and it may take up to 30 days for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged in directly into this webinar, then you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we do not have any way of tracking your online attendance. To receive CEU credit, please make sure that you are using an individualized confirmation URL that you would receive after you register using your personal email address. If you have any, email, if you have any questions during today's presentation, you can send those to us at any time using the questions box, and we will save the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's program to get to those questions. We have two fabulous presenters with us today. We have Dr. Lakeland Hogan Eichenberger, who serves as a gerontologist and caregiving advocate at the global headquarters of Home Instead. Lakeland began her career at the local Home Instead franchise in Omaha, working one-on-one -on -one with seniors and caregivers. Today at the Global Headquarters, Lakeland works to educate professionals in aging, families, and communities on the unique challenges of older adults and the older adults face and, resort and resources available to help them thrive. Lakeland earned a PhD in gerontology from the University of Nebraska, Omaha. We also have Amanda Williams, MSN and registered nurse that has focused her career on value-based care and population health strategies to transform healthcare. She works to design processes that are put in the patient at the forefront of their care journey with a significant focus on autonomy, flexibility, wellness, and prevention. This passion led her to Home Instead, where she is part of the healthcare transformation team at the global headquarters, working to implement strategies that make home care a valuable and strategic partner in the healthcare continuum. Amanda currently serves on the Board of Directors for Heartland Family Services, a wonderful organization that strengthens the community through advocacy and counseling. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you so much, Julia. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you've taken time to join us for today's webinar. I'm really excited to be joined by my colleague, Amanda. Um, you'll be hearing for her, from her in just a bit. Um, so, Today's topic, I know Julia mentioned it already, but it's we're talking about the lessons learned from the COVID pandemic. And I'm sorry if you're, you're sick of hearing about COVID in the pandemic, uh, but it is important that we reflect on the lessons learned. I know the most recent ASA Generations online journal focused on the impacts of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so this webinar is in line with some of that great information. If you haven't read that, Generations Journal yet, please go out and read it. It has such great information in it. And while the pandemic really has impacted all of us in different ways, we want to talk today specifically about how it has impacted home care. Uh, you know, for, for years, uh, home care hasn't really been seen as um, a part of the healthcare continuum. It's really been seen as something separate, uh, something non-medical, uh, so the two have really become separate. But at a time during the pandemic when it was important to keep older adults out of a hospital setting, uh, home care really stepped in to help meet a lot of the health and safety needs of many older adults during that time. You know, and in the home care world, we have known uh, the value of our service for decades, but again, due to the pandemic, home care is finally being recognized as an extension of the healthcare continuum and is becoming more valued by the long-term care system. So we're gonna be talking more about this today. And again, I'm excited to have Amanda join us uh, and she'll be sharing in a little bit about some of uh, her perspective on how the healthcare landscape is changing. 
But before we dive too far deep into this topic, I wanted to go over the objectives quickly. I'm going to uh, be talking about the impacts of the pandemic on the aging population. It might be a review for some of us, um, but uh, also talk about home care. I think there's still a lot of misconceptions about what home care is and isn't, um, but we'll be talking about how home care can best support aging individuals and their families. We'll talk about the value of home care as part of the health care continuum, and then we'll wrap up with some case studies. I think it's all sometimes helpful to kind of see home care in action, if you will, um, and talk about some of the successful partnerships that we're seeing form between home care and various parts of the healthcare continuum. So I mentioned we'll start by talking about some of the impacts that uh, the pandemic has had on the older adult population. I apologize, I didn't realize they were all gonna show up one at a time. So I'll click through oops, them all here quickly. Um, but we know that social isolation and loneliness has been a pandemic or an epidemic amongst the aging population far before COVID was ever part of our vocabulary. And I think what's so interesting is that during the pandemic, we all got a little bit of a taste of what it feels like to be isolated and lonely. Uh, but we saw during the pandemic that, you know, older adults, older adults continued to be isolated, continued to be lonely, and in fact, that increased for many uh, due to the public health recommendations uh, to, you know, stay in place to prevent the spread of COVID, you know, not to go out. A lot of things shut down. Um, and so older adults during this time reported feeling less socially connected. Uh, and many said that they were more lonely since the start of COVID-19. We also know that about two thirds of older adults were at high risk of uh, uh, when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, many of them have medical, medical conditions of their own, and then age um, was a risk factor as well. And so uh, because of that, because of the, um, you know, maybe the fear, um, the, the stresses, many did report feeling, you know, more stressed about, um, you know, getting COVID, uh, giving it to someone else, uh, their loved ones, and so that really did create some additional stressors and also kind of fed into the, that increased isolation and loneliness. And we also saw the use of technology increase. Um, you know, because of COVID, many, many activities became virtual. Um, many of us virtually uh, started going to work uh, and, 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 you know, not being there in person. So we all had to kind of become more uh, comfortable with technology. And, you know, there is a good uh, portion of, of the older population that was able to adapt to that, able to use new technologies, but often the older adult needed help with that technology. Many lacked access to the technology needed or lacked internet access. So um, while, you know, the use of technology was, was great for some individuals, there were barriers uh, to virtual engagement for others. If we look specifically at the kind of health care of older adults, um, we saw a lot more telemedicine happening. Um, but again, some individuals lacked access to the technology for telehealth, and they had to kind of just do phone calls with their health care provider, uh, which we know um, create some challenges in and of itself. Uh, and also some needed help with technology in order to be successful in utilizing telehealth. A portion of the older adult population was uh, not able to obtain household supplies or necessities, or they had challenges with that, uh, such as, you know, getting, you know, groceries, medications, uh, those sort of just those things that we, we all need to survive. We also saw older adults and their caregivers experience negative financial impacts, especially for caregivers. Um, many saw reduced hours at work, uh, perhaps unemployment, uh, maybe even a reduced wage or salary. Some people were laid off. Um, some people lost insurance. So there was definitely um, some financial impacts for many people felt during this pandemic. Some experienced interruption in their support services. You know, those older adults that really relied on the socialization and, and activities of an adult day center or a senior center, you know, during uh, 
the, the first part of the pandemic, those services were just cut off. Uh, and so I heard from a lot of family caregivers and a lot of older adults that that really was their, um, you know, source of engagement throughout the week. And so that interruption of services was really uh, a stress and strain on their support system. And also some um, even kind of home care, home health services might have been interrupted for a variety of reasons. So again, um, you know, that, that support system was perhaps a little more limited, which resulted in an increase in reliance on family members for support. Um, and a lot of families, family members kind of realized for the first time that they were a caregiver. Uh, they were starting to have to do more and more for their aging loved one, uh, again, because maybe their loved one wasn't able to get out and go to the grocery store or, um, you know, uh, rely on those other types of support uh, because of the pandemic. And then we all experienced varying degrees of loss during the pandemic, um, loss of normal life, loss of a loved one. Oh, I apologize that these slides must be on a timer. I am so sorry, everyone. We'll try to get that back up here. Um, so uh, again, I was talking about loss. So we, you know, we all experience loss. Uh, in a variety of ways, loss of our normal life, normal activity, and a lot of us lost loved ones or people close to us. And during the pandemic, you know, our normal uh, bereavement practices, our grieving rituals were, were, you know, not able to take place or they had to look a lot different. And so that is, you know, challenging going through that significant loss. It's also important to acknowledge that subpopulations were disproportionately impacted by COVID, uh, including racial and ethnic minorities, individuals with disabilities, uh, people in rural populations and, and tribal populations. All were impacted in a lot of these categories more significantly than others. Uh, some additional uh, impacts that we're kind of seeing now that we're about two years out of the pandemic, we kind of feel like life's getting a little bit back to normal. Uh, many older adults still feel kind of fearful uh, of COVID. They're hesitant to jump too quickly back into social life. Uh, and others kind of are, are grieving the loss of two years of their lives, kind of at the end of life, uh, end of their lives, that last chapter, they feel like they were kind of robbed of that time. So uh, I think those are just important considerations for all of us to see in, or to think about um, when it comes to the impacts that um, the pandemic has had on older adults. Another uh, impact that we have seen in our industry is, you know, that in increased desire to stay home. Um, you know, the goal, again, was to keep older adults out of a hospital setting where the healthcare system was stretched really thin. Hospitals wore areas of high risk of transmission of COVID. So, again, there was a lot of healthcare being brought into the home. Um, and, and as a result, that increased it resulted also in an increased demand for home-based services, including home care. Um, and so we're seeing that demand increase um, within our organization. And again, older adults, um, when they're kind of weighing their options of how and where they want to age, we're still seeing a trend towards wanting to stay home as long as possible. But even though um, Many of us work in the field of, of healthcare or aging services. There's still quite a bit of confusion around what is home care and what is it not. So I thought that it could be helpful to go over the types of care uh, that home care uh, provides and then kind of talk about how that differ differs from home health care. Uh, so uh, home care services uh, include things such as personal care services, which is help with uh, kind of bathing, grooming, restroom assistance, mobility care. Some people kind of refer to it as hands-on care. Another important component is companionship. Uh, our, the home care services can combat loneliness and isolation with the regular home care visits. A lot of times home care is referred to as a sitter service. I hear that a lot. Um, and it is it definitely far more than that. But I don't ever want to um, 
devalue the companionship component because I think that that is such a valuable part of the service, but it is not limited to just that. Meal preparation and, and home helper type services, uh, preparing nutritious meals, assisting with like housekeeping. Transportation is another um, thing that we often help with. Um, and we can provide transportation to things like, like those errands, uh, but also to medical appointments, which is so important, especially for those with chronic conditions that are just, um, you know, discharged from a hospital setting, that sort of thing. Also, medication management and reminders, helping people adhere to medication regimens. Alzheimer's and dementia care. Uh, sometimes I, I refer to this as memory support at home. Uh, in our organization, we have a specialized Alzheimer's training that meets the dementia care practice recommendations uh, for person-centered care that the Alzheimer's Association puts out. We go through their curriculum review process to ensure that, um, that the individuals that we employ understand dementia and can best work with individuals that are living with dementia to tailor the care to their needs. And then we can follow individuals through end of life with home care. And so while we don't provide hospice, hospice is a separate service, we can support families and the individual while they are receiving hospice at end of life. Uh, and, a, and a lot of the, the people that we serve, we, we maybe start with them when they just need, you know, some of that companionship, meal preparation, home helper, and then the home care service can evolve to add things like that personal care, that Alzheimer's and dementia care, and then follow that person through the end of their life. So how does this differ from home health care? Uh, well, Home care, you do not need a prescription, uh, a, a, an order from a doctor to receive home care services. Uh, but for home health, you do, in, in most cases, need um, a medical professional to, um, to give orders for home health services. Uh, and home health often is very task-based. Um, you know, it's usually a clinician like a nurse, occupational therapist speech therapists that come in for a very specific task, and then they leave. Uh, and so often I hear from home health professionals that, you know, it, it kind of weighs on their heart a little bit because they'll go in to do physical therapy, and then, you know, when that task is complete, the, the older adult is asking, you know, can you stay and help me with, with my laundry, or can you just um, fix me a little something to eat? And that's really outside of their scope of work. Um, but because they love to help people, they have, again, that kind of tug of war in their heart, you know, should I help them? But no, I have to move on to my next patient. Um, and so that's where a service like home care can really come in and do that wraparound service, get that meal, do that laundry, provide uh, bathing assistance, that sort of a thing. Also, there's a difference in payment source. Home health, um, in very specific cases, is covered by Medicare. Um, whereas home care services are primarily, at this point, private pay, long-term care insurance. There are some uh, Medic Medicaid benefits for some home care, but it's very specific in who can qualify for that. Uh, a lot of people have a misconception in general that you know Social Security and Medicare are gonna pay for all of their care needs at the end of life, and we just know that that is not the case. Um, and so, again, there is a difference between home health and home care. Again, uh, home health is that very task-based care, um, and then uh, home care really can be that wraparound service. It doesn't have to just be for, for one task. And often we, we, um, we see home care having, you know, minimum hours of, uh, for their visits. Um, because they are helping with so many of these different activities, uh, they want to be able to be sure that they can meet all the needs of the people that they're working for. And I think it's also important to understand that there's different types of home care um, in terms of uh, how a family can go about finding home care providers. So uh, you can find home care providers through an agency. Um, home Instead is an example of an agency. Uh, you can um, you can also go to what's called a registry where a company kind of helps you find 
the, the provider, and then you as the family then employ that home care provider directly. Or you can find an independent caregiver, a professional home care worker, um, where it could be, you know, the neighbor down the street. Or maybe you uh, kind of put an ad out in your church bulletin that you're looking for somebody. Or uh, on Craigslist, you find a provider. And, and you are, uh, again, the employer of that home care provider. Uh, so this is uh, the, a model for what more of an agency looks like. Again, at Home and Said, we are an agency. And so this is kind of our model, uh, just as one example. Uh, but in an agency model, the agency directly employs the home care professional. Um, and they take on all of our employment responsibilities, background checking, bond and insurance, bonding and insurance, ensuring um, training the home care professional. Um, you know, we at Home and Said use a person-centered care model where the older adult and their loved ones are at the very center of the care. You know, that professional home care uh, worker provides that day-to-day -day care, but then there's also a team, uh, the agency staff, that is supporting both the family and the professional caregivers. So the service team usually schedules and, and coordinates the care. Uh, the client care team manages the care and does routine quality assurance checks. And then we have our recruitment and retention and training team to make sure that the professional caregivers have all that they need to, to do their job to the best of their abilities. Uh, also on our on uh, the, the client care team, uh, many of our offices are starting to explore what's called nurse-directed services. Uh, so um, providing a little bit more of a scope of care. Uh, I won't go too far into that today. Um, it's, not, it's not available widely, but we're starting to see more nurses on staff too to provide uh, extra oversight for some of those additional services that some home care providers are starting to, to um, provide in, in various markets. Um, and so there are benefits to going with an agency versus going with a, um, a private caregiver. Uh, and, um, you know, I'll share some resources at the end of today's webinar that can help families kind of think through those important questions. Uh, but I just, again, I wanted to set the stage of what is home care, how is it delivered, before we go further into, you know, how the, um, the pandemic has really impacted the home care industry. So, um, again, before the pandemic, home care wasn't always seen as part of the healthcare continuum. And so when the pandemic first started, uh, Home Instead, along with organizations like the Home Care Association of America, really helped to advocate for home care workers becoming essential, uh, essential workers, so that they can continue to provide support to the older adults that they serve. We also saw home care agencies rapidly respond to the safety needs of their workers and their clients. You know, at Home Instead, we were able to spin up a PPE, uh, personal protective equipment store, you know, your masks, gloves, gowns, all of that. We were able to spin that up really quickly in a matter of days to make sure that all of our offices across our network were, were getting the PPE that the professional caregivers needed to stay safe, to keep themselves safe and the people that they were serving safe. We also saw an increased demand for home care services. I talked already about how people were trying to, you know, keep their loved ones out of hospital settings during this time, uh, but also we were seeing, um, you know, people living in facility settings, senior living, um, and those were in lockdown. And so people that pre-pandemic were trying to decide, you know, do I move my loved one into a facility or do I keep them at home? During that period, a lot of people thought, um, you know, it might be best at this point to keep my loved one at home and kind of wait for the pandemic to kind of calm down. And so they opted for home care uh, during that time. Now, because of the growing demand, we're seeing a uh, workforce shortage. Um, and really, this is an accumulation of, of several trends that are happening. Um, first is that increased demand for home-based services that I just talked about. But also, there is a growing number of older adults um, you know, in our society who need care and support. Uh, and that trend was happening way before the pandemic, again, came into our lives. Uh, so there's just a growing number of older adults that need support. But also, um, there is also an increased awareness of care options. 
uh, home care being one of them. So I'll talk a little, little bit more about the options for, for care, um, you know, later in life. But because of these kind of varying uh, this, the culmination of these varying trends, uh, the supply of workers is really not adequate to meet the demand. So we're seeing that this is resulting in some cases in, in higher wages and higher operating costs. Uh, in some cases, uh, families are challenged in trying to find home care. And so at Home Instead, we're working diligently uh, to recruit and retain um, our quality home care providers. But I think what this also does is position home care as an industry that is ripe for innovation. While we're feeling the strains on workforce, um, many providers are starting to get really innovative um, in how they can solve for this. We're seeing a lot of venture capital funding come into the home care space. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions happening. And while that might not impact you uh, as, you know, uh, on, on your, your individual local level, might not impact directly, you know, the older adult and the services they're being provided with, um, it is kind of just a shift in our home care industry. In fact, Home Instead was acquired uh, in August of last year by a technology-based company called Honor Technologies. Uh, we're really looking at innovative ways to become more efficient in our staffing uh, and the utilization of our, our existing workforce and growing our workforce. We're also looking at ways technology can help us be more efficient in the care that we provide in the home. So it's a really exciting time. Um, some people might say, well, how can high tech come in to uh, an, uh, an industry that is so high touch? You know, home care is so personal. But I think that um, you'll be seeing more of kind of a marrying of high tech and high touch, those two coming together to provide for the needs of more older adults, especially as we can continue to be constrained by kind of these workforce um, shortages. Uh, but we know that home care has many benefits um, to individuals, families, and to society as a whole. We know that home care can enhance emotional well-being. It can, can support independence for an individual at home. It can promote social engagement, someone to talk with, someone to listen to their stories. Again, social connection we have learned through this pandemic is so valuable. Uh, we can, we can um, provide better care for people living with dementia. You know, having support in the home can help um, ensure that that person living with dementia um, is engaged uh, in their day, make sure that the, the family gets a break from caregiving. We find that providing family, family caregivers providing care to an older adult with a type of dementia, they experience more stress and strain than non-dementia caregivers. And so home care can kind of help uh, with those, um, those challenges. Um, and also it allows them to stay at home in their familiar surroundings. Um, you know, if somebody has lived in their home for 30 plus years, uh, they might know where things are and they might be able to live a little more independently for a longer period of time. Uh, it can be an alternative to facility care or memory care, or it can prolong the need to make that move. Uh, but we also acknowledge that there is a point for a lot of individuals where making the move to facility care uh, might be best for them. Uh, but during that period, home care can kind of help ease that transition. Um, we also find greater flexibility and peace of mind for family caregivers. The care is customized to the needs of the older adult and their family. Um, and it can help caregivers, family caregivers continue to maybe work, uh, might again allow that time away from their caregiving role with peace of mind knowing that their, their loved one is in good hands of the home care provider. Also, we see better care coordination, especially in cases uh, where, um, you know, the home care company can help, uh, especially after a transition home from a hospital, stay or a rehab stay, having home care in there can help to ensure that the discharge orders are being followed, follow-up appointments are getting uh, completed, those types of things. And also improved care safety and quality. Uh, care coordination can help improve uh, the safety and quality, again, especially after I mentioned that, that dis discharge from a hospital can help reduce readmissions. Uh, home care individuals 
can help to identify red flags and notify families and healthcare providers um, if something kind of looks out of the norm. Um, and instead of rushing to the ER, can uh, notify um, the healthcare provider to see if it's something that, yes, needs to go to the ER or maybe just a follow-up doctor's appointment um, can help uh, with the situation. So, um, and then and then the last one would be lower health care costs. Uh, caring for someone at home is generally less expensive, uh, and also it can be a cost savings. Uh, can help to also ensure that the older adult again is um, has good quality of life and kind of can in a way can kind of be preventative and making sure you know they're eating, they're well hydrated, they're taking their medications to hopefully uh, again delay any need to move from the home to a care facility. So um, those are some of the benefits uh, again to the family, the individuals, and uh, society as a whole. And I mentioned kind of how the fact that there are more choices than ever before when it comes to care. Uh, I know this visual here on the slide might be hard to read for those of you that have kind of a small screen, um, but really home care, or sorry, senior care options um, are so much more vast than they were even just 30 years ago. I know when Home Instead started, it was really one option, move your loved one to a nursing home or move them in with family. Uh, but now there are things like uh, independent living uh, facilities, senior apartments, retirement communities, uh, CCRCs, which are continuing care retirement communities. They kind of have the whole spectrum of care on one campus. We see assisted living, uh, you know, home health, more and more uh, health care is coming into the home, hospice care, memory care, and of course nursing homes are still uh, around today. Uh, a lot of people also go to kind of a short-term rehab stay in a skilled facility and then tr transition back home. But one uh, type of care that can be provided across the entire care spectrum is home care. You know, I mentioned earlier home care can start with somebody when they're pretty independent still and follow them all the way to end of life. And so uh, we're finding it beneficial to partner with various parts of the care continuum and care spectrum to provide better quality care uh, to older adults. And, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit. But in the meantime, I'm going to pass it to Amanda, who will talk about the changing healthcare landscape. So Amanda, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Lakeland. Um, we are going to, as Lakeland said, we're going to change gears just a little bit and talk about the changing healthcare landscape and also the value that home care can bring to our healthcare partners. Um, prior to COVID, uh, the U.S. healthcare was already going through a shift in our reimbursement system. And traditionally, healthcare systems were paid by insurance companies like Medicare, for example, under what's called a fee for service reimbursement structure. Uh, very simply, this means that a fee was charged to the insurance company for every healthcare service that was rendered. Every lab, diagnostic, procedure, and office visit was billed separately, for the most part, and these services were paid for, regardless of the outcome or quality of the care that was provided. Criticisms of this reimbursement structure was that it created a culture of waste and overutilization. Additionally, overall healthcare costs in the U.S. were very expensive compared to other developed nations. In order to control healthcare costs, legislation, largely started by the Affordable Care Act, was passed to begin moving healthcare reimbursement away from fee-for-service and towards value-based care. This is a shift in volume over value, volume being that um, uh, kind of sense of overutilization with fee-for-service and value moving towards value-based care where reimbursement is attached to quality outcomes. Um, I said earlier that this shift was already occurring before COVID, but there were many barriers to get legacy healthcare delivery systems to begin operating beyond the hospital or facility walls. While very complex, COVID created an environment that was ripe for innovation, as Lakeland said earlier, and helped to further accelerate the possibilities of caring for higher acuity patients in non-traditional settings like the home. So um, with that background on the changing healthcare landscape, let's take a closer look at why care in the home is changing. There are four key factors that are pushing care into the home and at a faster rate than we've previously seen. 
One of the first key factors is that the U.S. and really the global population is aging. Today, there are more than 46 million older adults, age 65 and older, living in the U.S. In about 30 years, by 2050, that number is expected to grow to almost 90 million, which is nearly double. For context, this is about a fifth of our total population. This is an unprecedented number of aging individuals in our society. The second key factor is that not only are people living longer, but the chronicity for these aging individuals is higher. Our aging individuals are living with more chronic diseases, frailty, disability, and cognitive decline due to conditions such as Alzheimer's and dementia. The third key factor is that older adults just want to stay in their home. Uh, one study showed that nearly 90% of adults over age 50 and across all age, race, income, and health status categories want to remain at home and age in place. And remember, this aging population in the U.S. is primarily the baby boomers. Uh, baby boomers have not only made significant impacts on American culture throughout their lifetime, but also um, on the economy, given the sheer volume of people attributed to this generation. If the demand of this generation is to age in place, then no doubt our society will latch on to that trend. We have already seen this with some major retailers, for example, creating aging in place programs. And the fourth key factor is the shift from fee-for-service to, to value-based care that we just discussed. In fee-for-service reimbursement structures, hospitals are revenue generators. In value-based care, they are costly. Shifting care from hospitals into lower cost settings, such as the home, is an important success factor to decreasing costs and being successful in value-based care initiatives. In addition, with so many aging people with more frailty and comorbidities, hospitals will only have enough room to take the sickest of the sick. Higher acuity patients will get pushed out to post-acute settings, and in turn, post-acute facilities will discharge higher acuity clients back into the community setting, which is the home. So this leads us back to the future. Home-based care has been around for centuries. Prior to and at the start of the 20th century, the home was the predominant site of care delivery. Starting in the 1920s with innovation in pharmaceuticals, anesthesia, and treatment techniques, the hospital business boomed. Care shifted into the hospital and physician's offices, and home-based care largely disappeared, as well as reimbursement for services rendered in the home. We are now entering a new era in healthcare where care is shifting back to the home, but this was proving to be a very slow process, like turning the Titanic, if you will. Getting providers and payers to change legacy care and billing practices is no easy feat. It is a culture change that can take years. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, even more demand was put on care at home. Hospitals suddenly, very suddenly, lacked capacity for many patients in need of care, leading to a stark choice between delaying care or finding a means to deliver it more effectively and efficiently in the home. Capacity challenges were compounded by many patients' fears of going to medical facilities where they could, be, where they could potentially be exposed to the COVID-19 virus. They wanted to be safe and not leave their home. Many even compromised their health for fear of exposure of COVID-19 infection. One national survey found that 80% of respondents said they were likely to use home-based care services, and of those, 30% said they were highly likely to do so. In many ways, we feel COVID-19 has shined a spotlight on home-based care services that are likely to deliver a permanent increase in demand for home care. Since the start of the pandemic, many aspects of care have been forced to move in home, since many hospitals are focusing efforts on COVID-19 patients and have since cleared beds and even entire units as a whole to meet the demand for these patients. With the risk of infection while going to a hospital or care facility, many patients have opted to skilled professionals to have the skilled professionals visit them in their home, especially with the number of outbreaks in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Another reason for the increased demand for home care services is affordability. 
Since the start of COVID-19, we've seen quite a bit of economic turmoil. This has forced many to seek more affordable forms of care, which home care has often been recognized as. Now let's discuss how home care supports healthcare systems during the pandemic and even beyond. If you put healthcare on a continuum, you can identify three major spaces, the pre-hospital, the hospital, and post-discharge post or post-acute space. Home care can support patients in all of these spaces. In the pre-hospital phase, our services can provide assistance with managing at-risk and rising risk populations. This is especially important to those that are participating in at-risk value-based care contracts. We can bring value by assisting with adherence to treatment plans for chronic disease management. We are in the home so we can assist with necessary in-home safety interventions, such as modifications in the bathroom for toileting and bathing assistance, or even something as simple as ensuring the rugs on the floor are not creating a fall risk. When one of Homestead's clients is, admit is admitted to the hospital, we can assist the acute care team and even the primary care providers team with key insights into the patient's home environment. We can provide information on family dynamics and behaviors and barriers in the home that may be detrimental to, to the patient's health and wellness after the hospitalization. From a post-discharge perspective, we can assist with all of the important non-medical interventions that ensure a safe and successful transition back to the home environment. As you can see, home care is an important service that can bring valuable outcomes across the continuum of care. And Lakeland touched on this, and I'd like to just kind of go back and review this topic. I think it's really important to note what differentiates home care from home health care, as these often get confused. Um, home health care really focuses on the medical aspects and sometimes the ADL support. Um, they're not in the home continuously, and again, you, the patient must qualify for um, home health care. Um, but they also don't support all of the wraparound services that we provide, such as laundry, housekeeping, grocery shopping, and transportation to physician visits, as Lakeland previous, previously mentioned. And really, really feel like this picture captures the unique and personal touch we provide in home care. Not only can we provide like the hands-on assistance with activities of daily living, but our care professionals provide companion for our clients as well. For some seniors, the aging process can feel lonely and isolating, especially when the loss of a significant other occurs. Imagine a senior who lives alone, always have a, having a companion to eat a meal or run errands with. This companionship can be life-changing for our clients. And not only do our services provide companionship for the client, but they can also offer respite for the primary caregiver in the home. It is not uncommon, and actually will become more common, that we see frail and elderly people caring for their frail and elderly loved ones in the home. This idea of respite care for the primary caregiver is another important extension of our services that healthcare does not provide for today. At Home Instead, we strive to expand the world's capacity to care. That is our mission. For a growing population of patients, the transition from hospital to home is an important turning point in their health and safety. When a patient leaves the hospital, physicians and nurses advise them through a list of, through a list of discharge instructions that include follow-up appointments, therapies, new medications, and sometimes changes to diet and exercise. When I worked in the hospital setting, we spent a great deal of effort to improve a patient's readiness for discharge. Most patients want to return home, but their readiness and capacity to learn about the new treatments is often limited during such a busy and stressful time. Patients receive a lot of new information in the hospital, and that can be very overwhelming. It's important to note that researchers have learned that transitions in care do not occur, do not occur solely during discharge planning at the hospital. It occurs for weeks and sometimes even months after the transition from facility to home. Patients must establish new self-care routines and find ways to integrate those routines into their daily lives. As they integrate the new routines, problems can arise and they may need additional capacity to care for themselves in the home. Having a companion in the home to help bridge this transition can be a critical success factor to avoiding a readmission. Home instead care professionals can provide important medication and therapy reminders and ensure adherence to follow-up visits when patients may not be able to drive themselves. 
And just as importantly as supporting a transition of care, we can assist with chronic disease management, even though we focus primarily on non-medical care. Your patients live 90% of their lives in their home environment. Their engagement with healthcare occurs only for a fraction of their lifetime. Therefore, having an ally in the home to assist with change management behaviors is crucial to lessening the progression of chronic disease and tightly managing that condition to avoid exacerbations and thus ED visits and hospitalizations. You can see on the slide different ways home instead services can support chronic disease management through adherence to treatment plans and medications, escalating observed changes in condition, and even accompanying patients to post-discharge follow-ups. The myriad of services we can provide support the treatment and education that is given to them by healthcare professionals like each of you. Think of us as an extension to your care team, your boots on the ground, field ops in the home. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to um, Lakeland and we will walk through some case studies. Thank you so much, Amanda, uh, for walking us through um, kind of the changes that are taking place in the healthcare landscape and how home care is starting to kind of fit in more frequently to um, the home care or the healthcare continuum. It's really, again, solidifying its place. So um, Amanda and I thought we'd kind of uh, wrap up the presentation today by taking you through a few case studies on how home care is really, um, again, partnering with various aspects of the home care sorry, healthcare continuum. I even kind of fumble with the, the words every now and then, I apologize. Um, but uh, again, we thought it, I, it would be helpful to kind of talk through these. So I first wanted to talk about a lot of the partnering that we're doing with home health. Uh, again, we're two separate services, but we're very complementary of one another. Uh, again, you know, home health can come in for OT, PT, speech therapy, nursing services, uh, and then home care can kind of pick up where they leave off and provide that wraparound care. So we're working with various national home health providers across the network, uh, and we're doing things like a pilot program uh, for observed change in conditions. So we have created protocols with these home health partners on uh, you know, the, the escalation process if we notice a change in the patient's condition. So uh, of course, we, we work to understand the individual's um, situation, their, their healthcare need, what would indicate a change in condition for that individual. We train our caregivers to then, if they observe that change in condition, to escalate the process. So notify the Home Instead franchise office that they work with, then Home Instead notifies the home health office, and then the home health uh, provider then triages to see, you know, if they can uh, intervene or if this person indeed needs to go to the ER or uh, needs to be readmitted to the hospital. But we know that home health providers uh, are really focused on reducing uh, readmissions. Uh, in other kind of pilot programs, we are working with um, home health um, to kind of identify those that are discharging from a, a facility that might have a higher than di desirable readmission rate or they're at higher risk for readmission. We're helping uh, in these cases uh, to do uh, check-in calls uh, by some of our home and set offices at these kind of risk points that are identified in that person's uh, individual case to hopefully help get ahead of and prevent uh, any issues that arises. And of course, the outcomes of those calls are reported back to the home health agency or, or even the skilled nursing facility if they were discharged uh, from one of those. Um, and again, those concerns, if there are any, are addressed and triaged. So we're, again, partnering. Uh, because home care is often in the home for longer periods of time, we can be those eyes and ears of the home, home health provider. Uh, and so you might see in your local community more partnerships between home care and home health. Also during the pandemic, we saw a, uh, a strengthening of partnership, partnerships with senior living facilities. Uh, we can provide home care wherever an older adult calls home, whether it be their individual residence or whether they live in a senior living community, independent living, assisted living, even skilled nursing facilities. Uh, and like, you know, uh, every industry, uh, staffing issues were a concern for senior living. Uh, and in many of our um, 
parts of our network, they were able to come alongside, our home care providers were able to come alongside these senior living facilities um, to kind of supplement their workforce or provide additional one-on-one -on -one support to uh, their residents. So uh, we were able to um, do things like assist with risk management, that one-on-one -on -one support for residents with more involved needs. Um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, home care workers were deemed essential workers. And so often, home care workers could go into a facility setting when family could not. So they were able to provide that additional uh, companionship to combat isolation and loneliness and depression. Uh, uh, home care could engage the residents uh, in socialization with, with that person individually or with other residents. Also, uh, we find that we partner well with even memory support, um, which, uh, again, memory support is a, is a fantastic service and, and is a really good fit for a lot of people, but sometimes even within a memory care facility, individuals may need more one-on-one -on -one support, especially if they are exhibiting dementia-related uh, dementia behaviors that um, are, are challenging to manage with kind of the, the staffing ratios. Sometimes home care can be brought in to provide additional service. I know um, when I worked at the local office, we had one woman in, in particular, uh, and we were with her for 12 hours during the day because uh, she, w she had a lot of high needs um, and, and the staff um, kind of needed that extra support for that individual. Um, and then, you know, it can be a benefit to the staff when partnering closely with senior living uh, communities. It can help, you know, supplement the staffing when, when especially during COVID when they were having staffing shortages. Uh, it can help, um, you know, a facility keep a resident in their apartment uh, for a longer period of time uh, to maybe ease a transition, maybe from independent to assisted living or assisted to skilled uh, skilled nursing facility. I can also, uh, again, when it comes to kind of uh, that one-on-one -on -one support, we can be those additional eyes and ears even in that facility and partner with the staff to uh, develop uh, strong uh, communication channels for any issues that arise. So we're seeing partnerships in those areas growing as well as partnering with hospice. Many families have a misconception that hospice will be there 24-7, um, but that's typically not the case. And so home care can fill those gaps between hospice visits. Uh, we can help to relieve families of care duties, often the personal care for individuals on hospice. That kind of defaults to the family, and sometimes families don't feel comfortable uh, with that kind of support of their loved one at end of life. And so home care can take on those personal care needs uh, they can help with that medication management. They can also provide emotional support and companionship to the individual that's actively dying and their family. Uh, they can also provide comfort and reassurance. And, and a lot of times I, I talk with families and at end of life, you want to be present with your loved one. And if you're having to do a lot of the care, uh, that can take away from that time of, of just being with the, lo with the loved one in those final moments. And so we're seeing a lot more partnering in the hospice arena as well. And then finally, I just wanted to talk with Amanda about two quick case studies on, um, on home care and how home care could be implemented to support, in this first case study, Mary. So um, Amanda, do you want to tell us a little bit about Mary and then we can, you and I can chat about how home care could support her? Sure, would love to. Thank you. So um, Mary here, she's an 87-year-old female with a significant history of Alzheimer's disease and heart failure. She's been hospitalized twice in the last year for acute CHF exacerbation. Mary lives at home with her husband of 50 years. Her husband is a patient and kind caregiver, but he is also aging. Mary's Alzheimer's often makes her forgetful, and it is difficult for her husband to manage both her health needs and his own. To keep their loved ones in their home, the family partners with Home Instead to, care, to have a care professional provide several hours of assistance to the couple on weekday morning. And Lakewin, since you're really uh, more of the expert in home care here than I am, uh, just a couple questions uh, for you to help explain, as you said, how home care can support uh, Mary and her husband. Um, yeah. So tell me, all right, great. So tell me a little bit about how having a care professional in the home can help alleviate 
um, some of the caregiver role strain that her husband may potentially be feeling? Yeah, that's a really good question because we often see couples uh, in the care that we provide. And, uh, and so in this case, the care professional could really start to help Mary with her morning routine. So that's not all falling on the husband. Um, they could help with some of her personal cares, maybe help her with a shower, with her hair, getting dressed in the morning. And then also, uh, because especially uh, at Home Instead, we have training on Alzheimer's and dementia, um, we train our caregivers to really get to know the person's routine and anticipate their needs. Um, so that, that caregiver could really be there to do that, to help with the, the morning routine and, again, take some of that off of Mary's husband. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one more question about Mary is, um, can you explain a little bit about how having a home and said care professional in the home can help with um, specifically Mary's CHS treatment plan? And how can it help identify the potential exacerbations maybe earlier than what she would be able to do on her, her own, especially with the Alzheimer's? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, the, the professional caregiver could really uh, understand what a change in condition would look like for Mary uh, and monitor for that. So maybe it's, you know, a change in her weight uh, is uh, an early indicator. And so they could help to weigh her on a daily basis and keep record of that. And if it's, it's fluctuating, um, you know, kind of go through that chain of command to alert the, the healthcare professional. Also, if, um, you know, any of her dietary restrictions impact her, her health condition, uh, they can ensure that, you know, for instance, she's eating a low sodium diet and help with kind of some of that meal preparation. Uh, also, making sure she's taking her medications properly and as directed, making sure that those meds are getting refilled, and then making sure she's getting to those routine follow-up visits or routine doctor's visits so that the, the healthcare provider can um, really stay on top of, of her condition. So great questions. I think we might need to move on to, to Jim because we're running a little short on time. Sure. Thank, thank you for those answers. And I just want to say real quick, you know, those, those were a lot of problems that we tried to solve um, from a healthcare perspective. And so what a value add home care can bring um, with the treatment plan and medication adherence and all of those, um, you know, problems that we've tried to solve to help reduce things like readmissions to the hospital. So thank you, Lakeland. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Amanda, um, I, uh, do you want to go ahead and read uh, a little bit about Jim, and then we can talk for just a minute about him, and I think we might not have time for questions. I apologize, everyone, but I would love to talk a little bit more about Jim before we wrap up. Sure, and Jim is a little bit different because he um, has lost his spouse, so let's, let's talk about Jim and how home care can help uh, support him in his aging journey. So Jim is 79, has COPD, and is on oxygen. His wife passed away about six months ago, so this is um, a very new loss that he's experienced. His wife played a significant role in helping to monitor his condition. She was also a great, great cook, and now that she's gone, Jim just struggles to prepare his own meals without becoming short of breath. In the last three months, Jim, Jim's health has declined, and he has been hospitalized several times. Jim's daughter can stop by a few times per week, but she is worried about his health. Home care now comes in on the days his daughter is unavailable to support him. So similar questions here, um, Lakeland, but I think, can you help us understand um, how uh, a care professional, care professional can assist Jim with his non-medical needs? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, uh, the home care professional can be another set of eyes and ears for Jim's daughter when she's not there. Uh, we can also help with that cooking that he is kind of struggling to do on his own. Uh, and if he's short of breath with kind of his cooking activities, I also think that he could probably use some help with some of his other household tasks like laundry, the light housekeeping. Um, and because he's recently experienced this loss, just the socialization, um, uh, maybe the, the professional caregiver can also really get to know him and find out, you know, what kind of things bring him joy so that as he's grieving, he's also having some, some happy experiences as well. Love all of those examples, Lakeland. Thank you. It's so important, that companionship side of things um, and how that can really change our clients' lives. So thank you for touching on that. 
I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you to um, discuss resources. Absolutely. And well, um, I know that, again, we um, are a little short on time. I apologize about that. And my slide is taking a while for all the bullets to come up in terms of resources. But um, I would encourage you to check out the resources that we have on the slide here. And if you would download the slides, these um, headers that are in pink will automatically link you to these resources. So uh, we have a couple guides out there, one on returning home, that transition home, uh, some funding solution information. I know I saw some questions about funding pop up, so I'd direct you to that. Of course, you can find out more about Home Instead. Uh, and also there's a, a great resource uh, where you can connect with a live social worker called Honor Expert. Uh, and also back to the kind of the cost aspect, Jen Morris does a great cost of care study that you can search by zip code. Uh, and then Home, Home Care Pulse and Home Care Association of America are two great kind of industry um, organizations where if you want to follow what's happening in the home care space, uh, you can certainly um, tune in to those organizations and follow them. So I appreciate all of you uh, joining us today. I apologize we didn't get to questions, uh, but if you do have questions, uh, Amanda and I's information is here on the last slide. We encourage you to send us an email. So Julia, sorry we ran over on time, but I'll, I'll kick it back to you. That's okay. It happens, you know. Um, and like you said, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us here at the American Society on Aging or um, Lakeland Amanda's emails are provided there. You will also get an email today by the end of the business day with a link to the CEU application. Um, and in that email, you will also have the slides attached. Um, so it will be easy for you to keep those. Um, again, you have 60 days to claim CEUs for today's webinar, and it may take up to 30 days for us to process and issue your CEUs. Um, we thank you for joining us. We thank Lakeland and Amanda and our partnership with Home Instead, um, and we hope to have you all join us again soon. Take care.